Would you welcome, please, our next storyteller, Matthew Dix. Thank you. It's December 23rd, 1988. I'm 17 years old. I'm coming out of the record store and I have a shopping bag in my hand. I see my friend Pat, he's coming towards me. He sees the bag and he asks me what's in it. I tell him it's a concert t-shirt. It's a Christmas present. It's a surprise Christmas present for our friend Benji, my best friend. Pat looks at me a little funny. And Pat's only 15, but he is already cooler than I will ever be in my entire life. So when he looks at me like this, I've learned to pay attention. Pat tells me that guys don't buy Christmas presents for other guys. He tells me they especially don't buy surprise Christmas presents <laughs> for other guys. He tells me that he has dated girls for six months and never bought them a single thing. So for me to buy Benji a surprise Christmas present is really strange. I'm suddenly feeling very self-conscious about the betta fish in the back seat of my car, the one I bought for Pat like an hour ago at the pet store, <laughs> and the comic books I bought for Coog, and the sweatshirt I bought for Tom. I have filled my car with Christmas presents for my friends. And I know that Pat is right. It is strange to buy surprise Christmas presents for your friends. But it's been a long time since I've had a good Christmas, and I want this year to be different. Through a combination of a failing marriage and persistent poverty and a terrible stepfather, the last Christmases have just been a disaster. A couple years ago, my parents were fighting in the kitchen. They were, they were screaming at each other just about a week before Christmas. And my stepfather, Neil, told my mother he was leaving, and this was it. And when he left, there was going to be no money, and we weren't going to have Christmas. And so my brothers and sisters did, and I did the only thing we could. We went to the basement. We took out the Christmas tree from the box, and we started pulling the tinsel, last year's tinsel, off the tree and ironing it out. We were thinking if we could get the tinsel, we could get enough, then we could tell our parents that they wouldn't have to buy that, and then maybe there would be enough money for Christmas no matter what happened. So I want this Christmas to be different. And it's going to be different because for the first time in my life, I have money in my pocket. I'm a McDonald's manager. I'm still going to high school, but I'm working at McDonald's full time. I make $5.75 an hour, and I am the richest person who I know. And I am going to use this money to buy myself a great Christmas. So I'm heading home now. I'm in my car. It's my mother's 1976 Datsun B210. It's a car about the size of a box of Pop-Tarts. I'm trying to get home so I can get the presents put into the house. I got to get the betta fish out of the cold before he dies. And I need to get my McDonald's uniform on because I have a shift later that day. It's like a, it's a beautiful winter day. It's snowing for the first time that season. The lawns are starting to become white and the road is getting slick. I'm going down a country road. I'm coming up a hill and as I come around the corner and back down the hill, my car starts to slide into the opposite lane. I look up and I see that there's a white Mercedes Benz coming right at me. In these moments, they say that time will slow down or stop, and for me, it is absolutely true. In the few seconds it takes before our cars collide, three thoughts cross my mind. The first is, I'm not wearing my seatbelt, and I always wear my seatbelt. But in the excitement of Christmas shopping for the first time in my life and the rush to get home to get my uniform, I have forgotten to put my seatbelt on on the worst day of my life to forget. The second thought I have is, I've always been told in these situations to steer into the skid. It occurs to me, I don't know what the hell that really means. <laughs> and I still don't know to this day what that really means. And the third thought I have is just one sentence. It's five words long. I actually say it out loud. I say, this is going to suck, and it does. When our cars hit head on, I'm thrown forward. My chin hits the steering wheel, and it knocks the entire bottom row of my teeth out and into my mouth in one chunk. My head goes past the steering wheel, and my forehead goes through the windshield. But I'm not ejected from the car because my legs surge forward at the same time. My right knee becomes embedded in the air conditioning unit. It pulls the skin right back to the bone. And my left leg hits the post for the emergency brake release. It knocks the handle off, but my left knee is skewered right on the post. 
my chest comes forward and it hits the steering wheel, it breaks ribs and it sucks all of the air out of my body. It happens in just a second and then shock descends upon me and it takes away all the pain and all the fear and the only thing I'm worried about are these teeth floating in my mouth. I get myself out of the car and I'm sort of crumpled by the open door. I'm sort of like half standing and half bending over. And the woman in the Mercedes gets out. It's a middle-aged lady and she's walking towards me. She's completely unharmed. She had a big car and a great seatbelt. But she sees me and she vomits in the middle of the street and faints. The first people that arrive at the scene, it's a pickup truck with a bunch of kids in the back. And the first one who gets to me is a kid younger than me. He helps to lay me down in the mud and the snow on the side of the road, and then he looks at me for a second, and then he leans in and says to me quietly, dude, you're fucked. <laughs> it is the most accurate medical assessment I will receive that day. The next person who arrives is a police officer and he takes his coat off and he lays it on me on the side of the road. He doesn't know how heavy it is though because my ribs are broken and it feels like it weighs a thousand pounds. I can barely breathe. I'm looking up at a white sky with snow falling into my eyes and I close my eyes. When I open them again, I'm in the back of an ambulance and there's a woman straddling my waist and she's pounding on my chest, which is on fire now. And there's a man behind me trying to shove a plastic tube down my throat when she starts screaming, he's back, he's back. And I think, who is back and why did he leave? And it's me. Uh, I, I was gone. I, I was out. My heart stopped and I stopped breathing for about a minute before they got me back. In the emergency room, they start working on me right away. Nurses are picking glass out of my forehead and dental surgeons come in and wire my teeth back down into my jaw. It's the most painful moment of the whole experience. And there's doctors working on my legs, getting them ready for surgery. A nurse comes over to me and she asks me for my contact information and I give her my parents' names and phone number and then I give her the number to McDonald's. I tell her that I have to be at work later and she needs to call and tell them that I'm not gonna be there. She looks at me like, like funny and crazy, but like she doesn't understand that like that drive through does not run well without me. Like I was dead an hour ago, but they need to make sure they have two people on later or things aren't going to go well. And she looks at me like I'm insane, but God bless her, she actually calls for me. The doctors are working on me and we're waiting for a surgeon because it's December 23rd and it's, they're hard to come by. And I am waiting for my parents to come and they're not coming. And I feel it first, but then I can see it in the eyes of the nurses and I can hear them wondering, where the hell is this kid's parents? Why are they not coming? I'll find out later that when my stepfather learned that I was stable, he went to check on the car first instead of me. And I'm feeling alone. I'm surrounded by people, but I am alone because I don't know any of them. But it turns out that I'm not alone because I start to hear people. When the woman call, when the nurse calls McDonald's, she tells the manager what's happened, and that manager tells my friends. And my friends start an old-fashioned phone tree, and they call everybody. And now the waiting room for the emergency room is filling up. It's filling up with 17 and 18-year-old kids in concert t-shirts and ripped jeans, and one 15-year-old kid who is cooler than all of them. And Benji is the first person to arrive at that hospital. And they are making the kinds of sounds that 18 year olds make. They are loud and they are obnoxious and I can hear them. And we're getting ready to roll into surgery and the nurses know that my parents aren't going to see me before I go. So they roll my gurney to the other side of the emergency room and they prop open the doors. And one by one, starting with Benji, each one of my friends stands in that doorway and they tell me that they love me, and they say terrible things to make me laugh. <laughs> the worst things. And as I'm rolled into the, into the operating room, I can hear them calling to me and telling me that they love me. None of the presents I buy for those friends ever make it into their hands. And it turns out the only casualty of the accident is the betta fish. He doesn't make it. But it turns out that Pat was wrong, that you can get your friends surprise Christmas presents because they give me the best present I have ever been given in my life. They give me the gift of family, a family that I haven't had for a long time 
and a family that I needed. And until I meet my wife 15 years later, it turns out that they are the only family that I need. Thank you.